to Mexico downright hot, considering, again, that it's the middle of January. On up the coast, the east coast, the low will be tracking into the... Her classmates. Evening. Hours later, Nicole was dead. I saw Nicole and I said hello and gave her a big hug and a kiss. Obviously, the next morning when I woke up to the news uh, that I, I mean, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I had chills. The neighbors who found the bodies were horrified. My husband is turning the same way and he's saying to me there's a body. There was a lot of blood. I was remembering as like it was coming down like a, a river. I just said, you murderer, and, and then he yelled, me? And I went, yes, you, and I hung up. The phone call from O.J. Simpson to his former in-laws the morning after Nicole was killed. His words still echo. Denise knew right away, and so did my mom. She was always fearful, always fearful. Yeah, one of, one of these days I have a feeling that I'm, that he's going to kill me. Nicole Simpson, dead from a knife wound to her throat, so deep that it nicked her spinal cord. I still can't believe she's gone. I still want to pick up that phone and say, hey, Nick. Nicole's friend... Right now, we all, we're all okay, but you got to tell the police to just back off. He's still alive, but he got a gun to his head. The O.J. Simpson story, he had it all. Loved by millions, O.J. was rich from commercials, movies, and business ventures. But suddenly, there were the killings, and O.J. Simpson would be to cast the celebrated athlete turned commercial spokesman and actor into the role of a vicious killer. Mr. Simpson is charged alone because he is the sole murderer, and that is why he is the only one charged. The events surrounding Simpson's arrest five days after the killings were bizarre. Shortly before he was scheduled to turn himself in, he was here at the home of his good friend and attorney Robert Kardashian. Other colleagues were also on hand, including attorneys and doctors. Then suddenly, O.J. Simpson... Simpson left behind a letter that sounded to some like a suicide note, in which he denied involvement in the killings. Everyone understand I had nothing to do with Nicole's murder. I think of my life most no matter what the outcome people will look and point i can't take that and then simpson was located on a southern california freeway nearly 100 million people watch the low speed police chase on national television it went through the interchange continuing northbound on the 405 Thousands of his fans lined the freeways, cheering, waving, and blowing him kisses. The Simpson held a gun to his friend. O.J. Simpson was behind bars for the murders of his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, Ron Goldman. She was tall, blonde, and beautiful. And since her death, the subject of hundreds of tabloid headlines. She was nothing but a woman who put other people in front of her, in front of herself. Got drunk and did drugs, that was so not my sister. It's overwhelming, we go. haven't had time to grieve. There's not a, a quiet moment. There's, when we have a quiet moment, I think we have a quiet moment, then they're the children. We'd like to dedicate this song, especially to Mrs. Nicole Simpson, you know. I'm gonna lie to an angel. Watching moment when the that was just, it's Nicole with her two kids. I was like, look, she's blonde. She's angel's blonde. Oh, over his head, over his head. The forgotten man in this murder case is Ron Goldman, but not forgotten by the circle of friends with whom he played softball. He had hit a towel. He was an answer. All the time. To his family and friends, his murder was incomprehensible. You think, oh, it was a bad dream, and then you realize that... It, it did happen and that you're never going to see him again. It will be tragic, you know, dearly missed, and uh, we're going to have to cope with that for the rest of our lives. With no known eyewitnesses to the stabbing, and will depend half At the time that this murder took place, O.J. was at home awaiting to get into a limousine to take him to the airport on a trip that had been planned well in advance for a promotional event in Chicago. But testimony from the limo driver who took Simpson to the airport might threaten Simpson's alibi. So from 10.40 to 10.50, you continue to ring the bell? Yeah. 
And you got no response? No. He says he saw a large dark figure run across Simpson's driveway shortly before 11 p.m. And after that, Simpson responded to his calls. The evidence is consistent and very powerful, even at this early stage of the case, that it, to indicate that the defendant has indeed committed every crime that he is charged with. I think that um, when it's all said and done, and when we've considered all the evidence in this case, I think that reasonable people will agree that he's innocent of these charges. Until the killing, Simpson's marriage had looked ideal to outsiders. But police 911 tapes revealed afterward that there had been troubles. Well, okay, what does he look like? He's O.J. Simpson. I think you know his record. Could you just send somebody okay. over here? Okay, what is he doing there? He just drove up again. He just drove somebody up. Somebody over? Okay, wait a minute. What kind of car is he in? A pair of gloves, one found at the murder scene, the other at O.J. Simpson's estate, would become crucial evidence for the prosecution. When I found the glove back here on this pathway, um, I'll have to... I, I have to admit to you that uh, the adrenaline started pumping. The defense hinted Furman may have planted the glove because Simpson's attorneys claimed it, it makes no sense that O.J. Simpson would go back go to back his back house to and... ...leave a bloody glove in his backyard. That just doesn't stand up to logic. The Los Angeles Police Department waited more than 10 hours to summon the county coroner to examine the bodies. The delay makes it impossible to pinpoint a precise time of death. The coroner's office admits it made more than a dozen mistakes in this case. Among them, a bottle marked urine actually contained liver bile. Nicole Brown Simpson's stomach contents were thrown away. And the deputy coroner admitted he didn't know what kind or how many knives were used. Despite vigorous searching, thus far, no murder weapon has been found. And at some point in the trial, it's believed the contents of the so-called mystery envelope will be revealed. CNN sources say it is a knife like this one that Simpson bought in May. Sources also say the knife is in mint condition. The families of the victims came to court regularly in the beginning and are expected to do so again. The man who was accused was my son-in-law. We loved him. How do you feel now? Justice will be done. I feel, I'm very, I feel so sure about this, that justice will be done. I have such confidence. And that means? Well, I want to answer. <laughs> We've managed to develop some sort of opinion, but um, we still want a fair trial. Uh, we want a trial that would be fair for everyone. He took my sister and Ron's life, but I can't hate him. And it's a hard thing, it's your family. You know, it's, it's hard. But um, I, I would forgive anybody that, that admits to their own sin. The O.J. Simpson story, what it comes down to is, did he do it? The Brown family, like the prosecution, are convinced he did. Simpson says that he didn't. How do you plead to count one and two? Absolutely 100% In the end, a jury will decide. Robert Vito, CNN, Los Angeles. When we return, an up-close look at Marsha Clark and the prosecution strategy. But first, a look back at O.J. Simpson, the American football hero turned actor and pitch man, now murder defendant. Did uh, my folks get to Disney World okay? Uh -huh. I still can't believe they went by themselves. <laughs> They're getting so weird. Over this chair and interviews Capitol Hill leaders, including Bob Dole. Monday night on Larry King Live 9 Eastern on CNN. Now let's take a look at the prosecution. The team is headed up by Deputy District Attorney Marsha Clark. 
Clark is joined by Deputy District Attorneys William Hodgman and Christopher Darden. They all work under the direction of Los Angeles County District Attorney Gil Garcetti. And joining me again is Roger Cossack, a former prosecutor with the L.A. District Attorney's Office. Roger, the prosecution is seated closer to the jury than the defense because the prosecution has to prove its case. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, Jim, it's up to the prosecution to convince each and every juror beyond a reasonable doubt of Mr. Simpson's guilt. If they fail to do that, it's called a hung jury, and they might have to do the whole thing all over again. We've been hearing that this is a case of circumstantial evidence. What is circumstantial evidence? Well, Jim, there's two kinds of evidence. There's direct and there's circumstantial. Direct would be if you're standing outside and it begins to rain and you get wet, you can testify that it's raining. Circumstantial would be, is, would be that if you're sitting inside and the door opens up and someone comes in that's soaking wet, you can draw an inference from that set of circumstances that it's raining outside. In this case, the prosecution is going to have to rely heavily on circumstantial evidence. There's no murder weapon, there's no fingerprints, and there's no confession. So they're going to be relying on circumstantial evidence like DNA. Let's take a closer look now at the person who has to prove the state's case, Deputy District Attorney Marsha Clark. Here's CNN's Art Harris. In the wake of the two murders, Marsha Clark was everywhere. At the crime scene, at the estate of the accused killer with the cops. Then in court, tangling with the best criminal lawyers money can buy. Right. Seems like a little bit of grandstanding. But, if uh, if the two of you, is, excuse me, I can't believe I heard Mr. Shapiro say that. Marsha Clark is no shrinking violet. She can put on the fancy dress and uh, hold her pinky up when she drinks the coffee, or she can just wade in and knock your teeth down your throat. Ready or not, Marsha Clark is now prime time, and the pressure is on. The L.A. District Attorney's Office has lost two recent high-profile cases, the acquittal of the police officers who beat Rodney King and hung juries in the Menendez brothers' murder case. To reverse that slump, Clark has to do what some would call the impossible, send a hometown hero to prison for two murders he says he didn't do. She's tried 21 homicides and hasn't lost a case in the last five years. But she's never been under this kind of microscope. The no, public no. has already heard no, defense Clark. counsels. Where everything she says. These misstatements are done deliberately. How she says it. I'll never do it again. I just. Promise? Oh, promises. Promise? Yes. And what she wears sparks debate. Even rival Robert Shapiro has commented on her, quote, great legs. At the same time, he's attacked her as unfair. It's appropriate to have an order to show cause rate contempt on the district attorney's office. I think that would push her button because I think Marsha Clark uh, considers herself very fair and very ethical. And I think she is. It's the old story. You put a black hat and a black bandana on the prosecutor and you make them look like a band of uh, desperados who are, who are beyond, the, beyond the law. To see how she's playing, the DA's office convened a practice jury in Phoenix to hear the case against Simpson. The panel called Clark too aggressive and said she didn't make her case. And a few people said bitch. Uh, and a few people thought she was very aggressive, tenacious, um, pushy. But those people only watched her on television, not in court. I don't think you can watch a person on television uh, on just what little bit we've seen and, and get a feel for that person. I think you got to be in the courtroom. Attorney Richard Leonard watched Clark send his client to prison for murder. She doesn't talk down to a jury. She talks to him in plain, simple language and makes the case very, very simple. And the families of victims say their pain feeds her passion for justice. She's sympathetic. She's caring. Marsha, in her own line of work, I think can tap into some of, to be honest, some of the rage that families feel who have lost victims to murder. One Clark fan is Hollywood director Brad Silberling. He planned to marry actress Rebecca Schaefer until she was gunned down by a fan who stalked her. Marsha Clark sent that killer to prison too, showing outrage at the trial. Robert Barta will not truly be punished for this crime until he is locked away. What I was so impressed with was she said, this person does not deserve to be sharing the same space that you and I are. An avenging angel for the dead. When she's losing her temper, it's probably because she wants to cling to make sure that that victim is still a part of the trial. At the Simpson trial, one veteran prosecutor predicts she'll bond with the jury as skillfully as anyone on Simpson's high-priced defense team. She's got the common touch. Uh, I don't think that she ever speaks over the heads of the jurors. And I think she tries to become one of them and let them know that she's not from a background where she had a silver spoon in her mouth. The daughter of a government bureaucrat, a former ballet dancer, Marsha Clark finished high school in New York. 
graduated from UCLA, and worked her way through law school here for $2.50 an hour as a waitress at Lowry's Steakhouse. Now, at 40, she's juggling the Simpson trial with her role as a single mother of two small children. Days before the Simpson case began, she filed for divorce from her second husband. But colleagues say she leaves her personal trials at the house and feels right at home with hard-nosed detectives who solve murders for a living. They relate great to Marsha because Marsha has a way of just becoming one of them. And Marsha can, uh, you know, can um, talk the talk like a truck driver. Sometimes she's made me blush. A street fighter in high heels, a tough cookie who doesn't crumble. This is a tough business. I mean, you're run against tough lawyers that are going to pick at you every bit of the way, and you've got to be tough. You know, you can't be a namby-pamby in there and be a good prosecutor. Art Harris, CNN, Los Angeles. Now, as we just saw in the Art Harris piece, Marsha Clark has clearly changed her look as a result of these focus groups. Roger, how effective have those changes been? Well, it's difficult to assess at this time, uh, Jim. It's clear that she was criticized for perhaps being too strident and too tough in these focus groups, and apparently she's taken some steps to try and soften her image. As a former prosecutor and an observer, what are Marsha Clark's strengths and what are her weaknesses? Well, I think she's very, very strong in one area, and that's her passion and, and belief, and, uh, and I think that will go right to the jury. Uh, Marsha Clark stands up and tells you exactly what she believes and how she believes. She's a strong, tough prosecutor, and this is a tough case. And I think the fact that she passionately believes in her case is going to be very helpful to the jury. The LADA's office has lost a number of recent high-profile cases. Politically, how important is it to win this one? Well, it's hard to say whether or not this is going to be the make-or-break case for Gil Garcetti, but it's clear that the Los Angeles County DA's office uh, has lost a lot of high-profile cases. Uh, Menendez uh, and other cases are, are such that it's going to come back to haunt Mr. Garcetti when he runs for re-election in another couple of years. From your standpoint, and it's easier as an armchair quarterback, what are the strategies that appear obvious at this point? Well, I think that in this case the prosecution will be relying heavily on scientific evidence as well as that physical evidence that was found at the scene of the crime. Uh, it's clear that they are hoping, at least, that the DNA will connect Mr. Simpson both to the scene of the crime and to his house as well as the bloody glove that was found at his house. Uh, I think the defense probably will, probably will be relying on the fact uh, that there isn't a large window of time for Mr. Simpson to have committed this crime. So I think that those are some of the issues that we'll be talking about. Thanks, Roger. And coming up, we'll take a look at the defense, the highest profile legal team ever assembled for one man, O.J. Simpson. We'll be right back. It's time to get this matter into a courtroom and let a jury of 12 people decide this case based on... Now a look at the defense. Assembling that team is high-profile lawyer Robert Shapiro. He's joined by Johnny Cochran, Jr. and retired law school dean Gerald Uhlman. Also on the team, F. Lee Bailey and Harvard Law Professor Alan Dershowitz. And a team of DNA legal experts. Joining me again, trial attorney Greta Van Susteren. Greta, we've seen that the prosecution has a burden of proof. What does the defense have to prove? The defense has to prove nothing. Only the prosecution has something to prove, and that's proof beyond a reasonable doubt. The defense can sit there absolutely silent. They don't even have to ask any witnesses questions. If the prosecution doesn't meet its burden to the satisfaction of the jury, they must return a verdict of not guilty. What about an affirmative defense? Well, the defense has the option of actually putting on information, putting on an affirmative defense. If O.J. Simpson wants to put on witnesses to show or to tend to show that he had nothing to do with the offense, he has a right to do so, but he is not compelled to do so because he doesn't have to prove anything. A question many people are asking, will O.J. Simpson testify? He doesn't have to. He can remain silent. But in this particular case, I expect that he will testify. He's going to want to testify before that jury to convince the jury that he is a believable, credible, and nonviolent person. He's a very smart man, and as a defense lawyer, defense lawyers are very happy when they get a witness such as O.J. Simpson. The jury is going to want to hear from him, so I expect he'll testify. Now, you said the prosecution will call witnesses. The defense will cross-examine. 
What is the purpose of a cross-exam? Well, cross-examination is simply asking questions of the other side's witnesses. You do that to challenge their witnesses, to pick apart at the case. The defense is going to ask questions of the prosecution's witnesses simply to try to pick at the case, to show that the prosecution can't meet its burden. Similarly, if the defense calls witnesses, including O.J. Simpson, the prosecution will be able to cross-examine, ask their witnesses questions in an effort to show that their witnesses are not believable. Okay, Greta, stand by. When we return, we'll continue our discussion on the defense and take a closer look at two members of this defense team. Stay with us. Go inside the world of CNN on your PC. For a free CompuServe membership kit, call this number. Let's take a look now at two key players on the defense team, Robert Shapiro and Johnny Cochran. They both made careers representing high-profile clients. Here's CNN's Ann McDermott. Robert Shapiro can play to the crowds. Morning, how are you? Good to see you, man. Robert Shapiro can play to the media. Very nice to see you. Robert Shapiro can play hardball in court. Shapiro addressing me or in court? I assume he's talking to me. I'm addressing the court, but I'm looking at you. I wanted to be clear. Well, I, I wanted to make sure that you understood this. Because... Give me counsel. Counsel, please. He is flamboyant and passionate, and many observers agree he is very, very good. Each lawyer thinks, rightly or wrongly, that he or she may be the best thing uh, to come down the pike since Clarence Darrow. Um, and, of course, that's not so. Uh, in this case, not only is Mr. Shapiro talking the talk, but he's able to walk the walk. He has represented Marlon Brando's son, Christian, and F. Lee Bailey. But the Simpson case made him a household name in just about every household with a television set that was tuned in the night Simpson disappeared. Please surrender immediately. Since then, he's become a celebrity at the courthouse. Can I have your autograph, please? And he's become a celebrity outside the courthouse. He appears to yes. handle it well. No surprise, perhaps, for a man who authored an article on dealing with the media. See you in a couple hours. He is hardworking, focused, and controlled, with an occasional lapse, like the time he muttered an obscenity in court. I'm offended by Mr. Shapiro's comment that he would even utter an expletive in open court just like that. Shapiro blamed it on the heat of the moment. I apologize to Mr. Hodgman. It was unprofessional of me. He seems to have few critics, at least few willing to go on the record about the veteran lawyer, but some have suggested Shapiro is a better deal maker than a trial attorney. Young Brando's case, for example, was resolved by a plea bargain. Others say that's unfair and point to his courtroom successes. Most of the criticism about him seems lukewarm and seems to focus on style rather than substance. I think if Mr. Shapiro can follow the rules of the road and uh, downplay perhaps the flamboyance that he's demonstrated thus far, he can be very, very effective. And courtroom observers say so far that's exactly what he's been. Very, very effective. Effective at casting at least some doubt on a case that many first figured to be open and shut. Before long, Shapiro was joined by another L.A. lawyer. Johnny Cochran could be called flashy. After all, he favors gold-rimmed glasses, pastel suits, personalized plates for his roles, and represents Michael Jackson. But if he is flashy, he is also friendly, a cheerful man who is happy to praise an opponent like prosecutor Bill Hodgman. He is an excellent lawyer. Flashy, friendly, and sometimes fearsome in time. court. Counsel stands here and, and, and makes these outrageous statements. But most of all, Johnny Cochran is a winner. Just ask Denzel Washington. He sought out Cochran as the model for his performance in Philadelphia. How many lawyers you go to before you call me? Cochran has long been a star of L.A. law, but the O.J. Simpson case will likely make him a national one, even international. Yet Cochran says all good attorneys rely not on their reputations, but on the well, facts initially. of a case. But I think what you find is that your press clippings stay at the door. He is much admired by colleagues. I think the world of Johnny Cochran is a lawyer. Uh, I like him on a personal level, and I think he's a great lawyer, and I think this is the perfect case for him. And others agree, saying it's because of the challenge and not race. 
Cochran has represented a lot of African Americans, but he is also representing Reginald Denny, the white truck driver who was nearly beaten to death by African Americans during the L.A. riots. Prosecutors recognize his skills and freely acknowledge their admiration. He's smooth as silk. He's a brilliant courtroom tactician. One conflict Cochran was concerned about in the Simpson case was his friendship with the former football great. That made him hesitate when asked to join the defense team, but join he did. And some veteran legal observers say that may have been the defense's smartest move of the case. Anne McDermott, CNN, Los Angeles. Okay, Greta, focus, if you will, on possible defense strategies. The defense strategy is going to continue to be the same since it's been since the beginning. That's very aggressive. They put a lot of pressure on the prosecution, hoping the prosecution will make mistakes. Mistakes only benefit the defense because that sometimes is reasonable doubt. Do you see the possibility of a plea bargain in this case? If O.J. Simpson is guilty, there is a possibility for a plea bargain, and that could occur as late as jury deliberations. Lawyers want to get the least amount of punishment for their clients when they're guilty, and if they conclude he's going to be convicted, there'll be some behind-the-scenes negotiating. And what would you say is the greatest obstacle facing the defense team? They're up against some good, tough, smart prosecutors. Thanks, Greta. Coming up next, we'll take an up-close look at the judge and jury inside the O.J. Simpson trial. Stay with us. Judge and jury. Throughout the past few months, we've seen a lot about Judge Lance Ito. From this position, he looks down on the entire courtroom, seated squarely between the prosecution and the defense. In this case, as in all cases, the judge serves as a neutral mediator in the trial process. I'm assigning the case to Judge Lance Ito. Prior to his appointment to the trial of the century, Judge Ito told a legal newspaper, quote, I think you would have to be crazy to want that case because of the amount of public scrutiny. Now the 44-year-old former prosecutor is a household name and coping with the same scrutiny as all the other prominent players. Ito has experience with high-profile cases. He presided over the savings and loan fraud trial of Charles Keating. Judge Ito is a uh, choice that is acceptable to us. Judge Ito will be acceptable to people as well. Neither defense nor prosecution objected to his appointment, even after the supervising judge disclosed that Ito's wife, Captain Margaret York, is the highest ranking woman on the L.A. police force. However, that connection did raise some questions later. All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Before releasing jurors for the holidays, Judge Ito stressed the crucial need for them to remain fair and focused. Please remember my admonition to you. Don't discuss the case amongst yourselves or with any other person. Don't allow anybody to contact you regarding this case. Don't allow yourself to be contacted or in any way influenced regarding this case. Judge Ito is a long-distance runner, which could be an asset given the stamina that may be needed to balance a fair trial, a free press, and the big egos involved in this unprecedented case. Greta, Roger, discuss, if you will, the role of the judge. Well, Jim, ordinarily the role of the judge is not that significant in that he or she just makes decisions on rather inconsequential points. However, sometimes the judge you selected is key to the case. For instance, in this particular case, the former judge ruled that that glove was admissible, that bloody glove. Another judge might not rule that way, and that glove may damage the defense more than they can recover from. Roger, how important is Judge Ito's personal history? Well, Jim, uh, we know that he was a career deputy district attorney right here at the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office, and we also know that he's married to the highest-ranking uh, female police officer on the Los Angeles Police Department. A lot of people would be, uh, if you were a defense lawyer, would be a little suspicious of someone like that. But as we both know, all parties agreed to accept him eagerly. Does it appear the judge has been tougher on one side than the other? Jim, I think the judge has been tougher on the defense, and I say that because there have been many opportunities when the prosecution has failed to do what it should do under the rules, yet the judge has taken no action to punish the prosecution. Most judges would punish the prosecution when they don't do their job. Well, I don't know about that, Greta. After all, the judge ruled that that conversation between the Reverend Rosie Greer and uh, O.J. Simpson is not going to be admissible, and that potentially could have been very damaging to the defense. So while it appears that oftentimes the prosecution does win, I think the judge has been fairly even-handed in this trial. But that was the right ruling, Roger. The judge really should have excluded any testimony that Rosie Greer had relating to the conversation with O.J. Simpson. Let's turn our attention now to the jury. These are the men and women who will ultimately decide O.J. Simpson's guilt or innocence. 
Greta, Roger, what kind of an impact on the jury will it be to have O.J. Simpson seated at the defense table? That may be the best thing that's happened to the defense because O.J. Simpson is a very likable guy and it's very difficult to convict someone you like. So the defense wants him there, he has a right to be there, and hopefully from the defense perspective, the jury will begin to like him just seeing him sitting in the courtroom. Roger? Well, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, after all, Mr. Simpson is accused of a very, very serious crime and there is uh, at least enough evidence to get him through a preliminary hearing and I suspect quite a bit more. I think this could backfire on the jury. I think that Mr. Simpson is the kind of man that people might uh, get angry at. No question about it, Roger, that it's a tragic offense, that it's a violence offense, but having O.J. sit there day after day after day, the jury's going to get accustomed to him, and there's a huge risk to the prosecution that the jury will begin to like him. It's easier to convict an enemy than it is to convict someone you know. One of the nice things about all of this is, though, that juries have a great deal of intuition, and they will pick up right away whether or not Simpson is being honest or dishonest by his, with his appearances. How do you assess the makeup of the jury, the race factor, the gender factor? Now, this is a difficult question that uh, perhaps uh, each person has their own feeling. I know that there's a great deal of criticism that there are, because there are so many African Americans, uh, but I, I don't put any stock in that. I see people uh, convict uh, people of the same uh, race and gender all the time, and I think we're going to have a fair trial in this case. I think race and gender are equally irrelevant in this particular case, in any case, because good lawyers can convince jurors of their position. And how do you see the prosecution and defense playing to the jurors? They're going to be spending every second of every day aware that that jury is sitting there watching them. And the defense is going to instruct O.J. Simpson, be very careful what you do and say and how you appear in front of the jury. And the lawyers are going to stick to the same code. And the reason they have someone like Marsha Clark and Bill Hodgman uh, assisting each other in this case is because they are so diametrically opposite. Bill is sort of an e even-handed, uh, easy-going guy, uh, where Marsha Clark is passionate and, uh, and almost angry uh, to the jury in her belief uh, uh, that she wants to convict Mr. Simpson. So I think that you'll see the prosecution uh, come down hard and, uh, and try, very, try very much to get a conviction in this case. But even Marsha Clark's vigor may be something that's very appealing to the jury because the jury is going to be appalled by this crime and they like to see an aggressive lawyer. So even the fact that she seems a bit aggressive or strident may not be something that hurts the prosecution. And the same is true of the defense. A jury likes to see a defense lawyer fight for a client. No question about it that we're going to see some sparks during this trial. Isn't that true, Greta? I hope we're going to see some sparks because that shows the lawyers have really got their heart and soul in it. Coming up, the media coverage. It's often been a blur of news, entertainment, and tabloid reporting in a surrounding of circus-like atmosphere. When we come back, we'll take a look at a day in the life of a CNN... All-wheel drive, all the time, transfers power to the wheels with the most traction. Wait, no, no, scratch the snow. Keep the hill and get something really slippery. So Quattro goes places the Mercedes C280 and BMW 325i, even with traction control, never dreamed. And it goes there for less. Nah, they never believe it. Audi Quattro from 27170, from the soul of Audi. We turn now to the media. During the busiest of times, the press area near the criminal courts building is a frenzy of reporters and producers amid a sea of satellite dishes and scaffolding. We follow along now with CNN's Mark Watts and witness a typical day with CNN covering the O.J. Simpson story. Mark Watts, this is Atlanta. Can you hear me? Okay, you're supposed to be getting uh, IFB now. Okay, uh, break to Let me picture, please. You are about to go inside our nerve center on location from a place called Camp O.J. Hello. CNN's Mark Watts from Los Angeles. Mark? Good morning, Donna. The camera always shows you this, but you rarely see what goes on behind the scenes. One, two, three, four, five, six. Got to go, Mark. You're about four minutes out, buddy. Okay. Hello. It's the morning of December 8th. Jury selection is supposed to wrap up today. CNN's Mark Watts in Los Angeles. Thanks for the information. And that's the first of seven live reports we do. Almost one every hour. The second piece of the bread at the courthouse. At the courthouse across the street from Camp OJ, photographers await the arrival of jury consultant Joe Ellen Demetrius. And once she arrives, we'll have approximately five minutes to send the videotape to Atlanta on a fiber optics line and get it edited for usage in the next reports. Yeah, go ahead, Tracy. Yeah, Joellen's coming in. Demetrius arrives. 
a courier brings the tape to our production trailer. Yes. This is for the Watts 12 o'clock live shot. Get to the Joel and VO when I say the players in the Simpson case began arriving about 25 minutes ago. Live crew, please send some audio. Play on the Simpson case is the roll cue for the VO. All right, here we go. Stand by, Mark Watts joins us with the latest. Mark? Now, a busy day on tap. The players in the Simpson case began arriving, oh, about 15 to 20 minutes ago. Who's arriving? Who's arriving? How are you? Cochran and Shapiro are arriving out back. I'll let you know in your ear if they say anything. Defense attorneys Johnny Cochran and Robert Shapiro have just arrived at the courthouse, so things should be getting underway. No, 12 peremptories, and then prosecution went first. In the meantime, the final jury selection process was being monitored on the 12th floor by CNN producers and media outlets throughout the world. It's competitive and everyone is plugged in. Then the announcement came. The thing is, both sides have accepted the panel as is. Moments later, we're on the air. A new development to tell you about now in the O.J. Simpson case. A jury finally has been seated. Finally, a milestone in the Simpson case. Next, a pool briefing from reporters who were inside the courtroom. There was um, a sigh of relief in the courtroom. The briefing is transmitted to Atlanta, and excerpts are used during the next two live reports. With the latest headline news. One for CNN headline news, and then CNN's World Today. For the latest developments, we go to CNN's Mark Watts in Los Angeles. Mark? Throughout it all, Judge Ito kept jury selection on course, and the process today completed. There was um, a sigh of relief in the courtroom. Judge Lancito later held an open hearing, dismissing the jurors and adjourning court. I'm going to excuse you all until Monday. And our workday was about to end. But first, some closing thoughts on O.J. Simpson and the completion of jury selection. And I think his mood speaks for everybody involved in this case. One of relief. All right, CNN's Mark Watts in Los Angeles. With that, Camp O.J. went dark done for the day back tomorrow back in about nine hours at 3 a.m. as we just saw the media outside the courtroom can be chaotic and frenzied but inside the courtroom it's not only controlled it's remote controlled my experience is that individuals coming into this courtroom and taking this witness seat and having cameras six feet away is pretty intimidating Despite those feelings, Judge Lance Ito agreed to allow three still photographers, a robotic still camera, and a single video camera to remain in the courtroom to provide pool coverage for all the networks, including CNN, as well as to local television stations. Both cameras are mounted on the wall, behind and high above the jury box, and operated via remote control by twin joysticks. Although the jurors will be safely out of range and may not be photographed, the video camera is able to pan from side to side and zoom in and out, allowing a bird's eye view of virtually the entire courtroom. At the bench, the judge has switches enabling him to shut off the four microphones placed within the courtroom. He can also monitor the picture from a small television set under his desk. The camera operator, who also has a TV monitor, will be seated inconspicuously among the trial watchers in the back of the courtroom. The Simpson trial will also spotlight high-tech equipment to display evidence to the jury. An 80-inch screen and several smaller monitors for the judge, counsel, and the witness will display documents, photographs, videotape, even animation as it's being discussed in court. That same image will be fed to the networks for broadcast. The judge will have the ability to turn the system on and off. Just ahead, some final thoughts from inside the Simpson trial with Greta Van Susteren and Roger Cossack right after this. Ever seen one of these? Classic movies. Roger, Greta, let's get your final thoughts. What are your expectations about the mood inside the courtroom during the jury phase of the trial? Jim, we're going to see everything. We're going to see anger. We're going to see the lawyers get mad. We're going to see the judge get mad. We're going to see a lot of grief when those autopsy pictures are passed around and everyone sees the devastating injuries that these two victims suffered. And periodically, we're going to see a little humor like you see in all trials. And I don't say that to be crass, but sometimes funny things happen during trial. But overall, it's a mood of seriousness. And then what happens after a while is a certain thing seems to take over in every serious trial like this. A certain work 
person-like quality happens. The jury gets down to work, the attorneys get down to work, and the judge gets down to work, and the trial seems to take on a life of its own until the conclusion. And something different happens, and all the media and all the hoopla seem to go away. Do you think that the jury will be affected by seeing the victims' families in the gallery? Without any doubt whatsoever, those families have endured so much. They've lost someone that they love, and the jury is very sensitive to that, and especially at those more important moments in the trial, for instance, when those autopsy pictures are passed around among the jury, and they know the families are sitting there, they're going to feel it. Of course, the interesting part of this will be whether or not uh, Mrs. Uh, Simpson's sister will become a witness in this trial. She has made statements uh, to the press indicating that she believes, at least, that Mr. Simpson is guilty. Uh, she's also made some other statements which uh, clearly indicate how she feels about him. Whether or not the prosecution calls her as a witness uh, remains to be seen. But if she does get called as a witness, and if she breaks down on the witness stand and starts to cry, even the most distant person would have to feel some sadness for her. Greta, what does this case say, if anything, about the price of justice? Well, Jim, it's really the question of what is the price of a fair trial. There's been an awful lot of money spent by the defense, but that simply matches what is spent by the prosecution. It's very hard to get a level playing field. Trials are expensive. Few defendants have the resources that O.J. Simpson has so that he can get a fair trial. But we've seen other wealthy people get convicted of crimes. And just because you have a lot of money, that doesn't necessarily mean you get acquitted. I think it sure helps, Greta, but it doesn't necessarily mean you get acquitted. No, but it sure helps you get a fair trial. Do you think we'll ever see anything like this again? Not only do I think that, but we'll probably see it very soon. These cases don't go away. I think when you spend your life being a criminal defense lawyer, one of the things you learn is uh, something called the, the human condition. And I think that goes to you learn that sometimes the good are not quite as good as they're supposed to be, and the bad uh, perhaps sometimes aren't as bad as they're supposed to be. And oftentimes people do things that... Uh, that just are unexplainable, and I think that you will see these kinds of things happen again. And on that note, that's it for this special look inside the Simpson trial. Our thanks both to Roger Cossack and Greta Van Susteren for your help. From the Criminal Courts Building in downtown Los Angeles, I'm Jim Moray. after taking office. How's President Clinton doing? I think he's demoralized our country. I think he's been overly bad. All season long. For the third year in a row, the Cowboys and the 49ers went head to head to decide who would represent